was first learning to play on the monkey bars, it wasn't easy for him and he struggled. I wanted to let him figure it out, but he was calling out for help. And other parents are looking at me like, why are you ignoring your child? I didn't know what to do. Now the reality was he was about six inches off the ground. <laughs> if he fell, it wasn't that big of a deal. He was struggling, but he was getting better each time. And soon he could fly across the monkey bars like it was nobody's business. What I hadn't really thought about was that there are different types of struggle. There's productive struggle and unproductive struggle. Productive struggle produces gains, and these gains help improve future performance. Unproductive struggle doesn't do that. It's sort of like struggle for the sake of struggle. You don't necessarily get any better. One metaphor we're thinking about this is with a bench presser and a spotter. A spotter's job is to give the bench presser the least amount of help so that the bench presser can lift the weight. In that way, the bench presser gets stronger every time. But if the weight is so heavy the bench presser can't even lift it, then they're not getting stronger, and it's unproductive struggle. So in this way, productive struggle is better than unproductive struggle. Because you have a cycle of struggle and feedback, and struggle and feedback and it leads to rewards, where unproductive struggle doesn't do that. It's sort of like flailing in the wind. So my question then is, what does this mean for education? Because if we're letting students productively struggle, but others perceive it as unproductive struggle, they're not going to understand our choices and may criticize us. In particular, there are three groups I'm concerned with. Students, other teachers, administrators, and parents, as well as yourself. Um, if we can deal with the messaging proactively, it's going to save us a lot of heartache because we'll be able to kind of get them on the same page as us. My colleague Annette tells a story about how she first realized this was a problem with students. It was about three weeks into the start of the school year, and students had come up to her and asked her, when are you going to start teaching us? And she said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, all you do is give us problems, you ask us questions. When are you going to tell us what to do and have us take notes? Now, these students aren't really used to this, so what we need to do is set their expectations early and often. We need to remind them that we're helping them learn how to learn. It's like the saying goes, we're teaching them to fish, not just giving them a fish. But they're not the only group that will have these kinds of concerns. Other teachers, parents, administrators, they also might doubt our choices. They don't have the benefit of seeing what we're doing firsthand in here, but secondhand. It sounds like this. My teacher doesn't care about me at all. All she does is let me suffer. When I ask her for help, she won't tell me what to do. Talk to the other teachers and administrators. Let them know your goals up front. Talk to parents at back to school night, at open house, or even in a letter on Monday. When they're clear about your goals, they're going to be on your side because they'll know that you have students' best interests in mind. But you may even doubt yourself. Think about a lesson that you really wanted to go so well. You worked really hard on it, but it didn't go the way you wanted. And somewhere in the middle of the lesson, you're like, why did I do it this way? Why did I just play it safe and tell them what to do? The reality is, though, you know your goal. You want students to productively struggle because it's going to be something that will help them in the long run. It doesn't mean it's going to be an easy to attain goal, even if it's worthwhile. So it's something we need to think about. I want to end then by talking about how learning how to write, ride a bike is like um, math education. Because when you learn how to ride a bike, there's this cycle again of struggle and feedback and struggle and feedback, and it leads to rewards. So with that in mind, how do we actually teach children how to ride a bike? Well, one way is we could actually ride the bike for them. We could go back and forth and back and forth. And that might be useful initially, but how long before it's silly for the child to watch the winner ride the bike for them? And how long before it's silly for students to watch their teachers do the math for them at the front of the class? Another way is with training wheels. Training wheels provide structure that enable the child to ride the bike, but oftentimes there are questions that give students or children a false sense of skill. I know I did this when I gave students procedures that they could do like a mindless math robot, but didn't really understand. Have you ever seen one of these? This is the balance bike. Notice it has no pedals. The only way you can use it is by cruising along and keeping your balance. In that way, again, you have this struggle and feedback that leads to rewards. Do we always have opportunities for this like this in our math classroom? Because if you don't, you're going to fall. The structure that you expected is no longer there and you don't know what to do. Similarly, we've all had kids that they could do these procedures, but when the problems change even slightly, it's like they had no idea what to do the training wheels that come off. So, here's my call to action. Give your students opportunities to productively struggle. You're going to need to remind them early and often. This is not going to be something that they're necessarily used to.